The reason the sun doesn't set on the British Empire is that God doesn't trust an Englishman in the dark. So years ago, back when I was a lieutenant stationed over in Virginia with the United States Marine Corps, we had an exchange officer from the UK spending time with our unit. Now, as the Marine Corps was founded in a bar, we make it a custom to take our friends out drinking. Seriously, the Brits had a reputation. We wanted to see if we could drink him under the table. Well, not only did he out drink all of us, but he managed to pick up the hottest girl in the bar. Now, if that only happened once, I would have attributed it to luck. But gents, over the next five months, we went to Georgetown five more times and every single time. This dude was pulling tail like no other. He had a freaking smooth accent that made him sound like James Bond. The name's Bond. James Bond. Looking like a freaking aristocrat that, yeah, we made fun of him on the first time we went out, but by the end of our six-month school, we were taking notes on the way this guy presented himself. So all this begs the question, why are the English so damn stylish? Are they taught how to dress? Do they have access to better clothing? Are they just bred better? Well, I guess it depends on who you talk to. But before I get into that, let's take a trip back to 1485, at the beginning of the Tudor era. So it was at this time, under the rule of King Henry VIII and Elizabeth I, that we saw England start to distinguish itself from the rest of the world with its own unique styles. The opulence of the royal courts at this time set the tone for the entire country. In fact, one particular item known as the ruff, which was an overly large starched collar that actually, depending on the size, depending on the detail, these things were not only incredibly expensive, well, these collars, these status symbols started to appear and all of a sudden the race was on to symbolize where in the class structure you stood. Other items like the doublet were worn by men to emphasize their masculinity. Over the doublet, men would wear a jerkin. Now, this was really important because it was an outer piece that was lined with fur and the detail that went into it would often highlight the status of the individual. And of course, who can forget the cod piece? Now, I know some of you guys are thinking, wow, I wish this would make a comeback. I mean, especially if you're well endowed, you might as well show the world what you're packing. Seriously, who is riding into battle with a full-on hard-on that needs to be protected? Now, the Stuart period starting in 1603 would mark the resistance of English style to the influence of the French. Items like the Cavalier hat, which as many of you guys know derived their name from Charles I, were noted for wearing their extravagant clothing. Other key style items that emerged during this period were both the buff coat and the frock coat. Now, the buff coat was really functional. This was a leather jacket, primarily worn by the military, but picked up by civilians as well. And the buff coat is remembered by clothing historians as an example of English practicality. But it's the frock coat that has actually survived still to this day, as this long, loose coat, which started to become popular at the end of the Stuart period, would eventually evolve into a key element of gentlemen's attire. Now, the Georgian era, starting in 1714, would see a further refinement of English style. It was during this time period that we saw the emergence of the great coat, a large, heavy overcoat. It was designed for warmth and protection against the elements. Breeches, basically knee-high trousers, became popular during this period, and they immediately became associated with those in higher class levels. And funny enough, here in the United States, when we think of breeches, when we see these type of trousers, we think of our founding fathers, the people that created this country. Now, the reality is men have been wearing forms of neckwear for thousands of years, but the cravat was a bit different. Made with linen or muslin, it was tied with elaborate knots and was really more for design and look and color than it was for the functional purpose of keeping the neck warm. And of course, let's not forget the wig. This was the time period in which they were all the rave. And again, when you wore a wig, this was a sign of social status. It was a sign of power. It was a way for a man to be able to move through society and those that were, in his opinion, beneath him to get out of his way. Now, gents, as I'm talking about this, I realize how arrogant and how, yeah, unfair some of this stuff can sound. But it's history, it's human nature, and my goal on this channel is to help you understand the power that style still has even today. Now, the Regency period was brief. We're talking less than 10 years. But this time period is important to highlight because this was the emergence of the uniform that would go on to mark the sign of the British Empire for the next 200 years. Gents, what I'm talking about here is the suit. Now, the suit was heavily influenced by a single individual, and that individual is Beau Brummel. When it came to style, Beau emphasized simplicity, 
cleanliness and tailored fit in a time period when that wasn't the norm. But because of his positions in society, he had a huge impact on its perception and he is credited with revolutionizing men's fashion in England and beyond. Now, specifically in this time period, we saw the emergence of the tailcoat. Now, the tailcoat descends from the frock coat. It's a lighter version and obviously the distinctive feature here is the tail in the back. It was also cut in a way that the jacket was structured. It flattered the wearer's waist and it emphasized broader shoulders. We also saw the emergence of pantaloons, an early form of trousers, as if these extended to the ankles and they were often worn with boots. And the waistcoat emerged in this period, worn under a tailcoat, because yes, you could go with a dull color, but at this time period, we also saw men starting to experiment with brighter colors and patterns that brought contrast to their outfits. Now, the Victorian era, starting in 1837, in which most historians say that British men's style solidified itself around the globe. The key items to come out of this time period were the morning coat. It had a cutaway front and it became the standard for daytime wear. The three-piece suit, a suit as many of you guys know, jacket, trouser made from the same material, but a three-piece has the vest. What I want to bring your attention is it's still around today and that's what I love about men's style because you can buy a classic timeless piece and you can know, hey, if it's been around for over a hundred years, there's a good chance the piece I'm going to buy will be around for another hundred years. That allows you to spend a little bit more money to get a quality piece knowing that this is not going to go out of fashion. And of course, let's not forget about hats. The classic bowler hat and top hat both appeared in this time period. Now, the top hat was more geared towards the upper class individuals, the bowler hat more for the middle class. And even today, the style of that hat we still see out there. And uh, if you ever see it, you're always thinking, yes, very typical English style. Now, if you're looking to level up your style, you really need to check out my free community over on school. I've set this community up. So, we've got free classes that you can make your way through step by step and learn the basic foundations of men's style. We actually have giveaways. In fact, this year alone, I've given away over 15 thousand dollars in gear that has accumulated here in my office and I love sending it out to you guys for your charge. And I have to say the men that are in this group are friggin' awesome. We've got a no a-hole policy. People treat each other with respect. And what we've managed to create in this community is a place where a man can come in and ask questions and get some solid advice. So, gents, use the link in the description of today's video. Go check out our free communities on school. These are for you to become the man you know yourself to be. Now, the Edwardian era would start in 1901. And it would continue what we saw in the Victorian era with the emergence of the Norfolk jacket, the Homburg hat and the lounge suit. After that, we saw the interwar period where we see the emergence of the trench coat, Oxford bags and Argyle sweaters. Again, Argyle sweaters, we still see them around today and the trench coat is still a classic piece of menswear. Very useful if you live in a place like Seattle, although we don't see it sold as much because a lot of men, well, they're traveling in vehicles and they want something shorter, which by the way, you can still go with a shorter trench coat. Post-World War II, we see items like the mod suit which is basically a suit with a slim fit, narrow lapels, which became the uniform of the subculture. We see the Chelsea boots made popular by the Beatles when they took the world in the 1960s, wearing their mod suits with their mop top haircuts and their Chelsea boots. Now, some of you guys are going to say, well, wait a minute, Chelsea boots, don't those go back to Queen Victoria? Shouldn't those have been in an earlier period? Yes, a lot of these items I'm talking about, like the trench coat actually been around for 50 years before it was pushed out, but it does take time. And that's one of the reasons English style, I think has had such an impact is these items had a growth period in which the designers, in which the craftsmen actually were able to take the item that had worked 50 years before and then whenever the timing was right, be able to share it with the entire world. Which now takes us to the meat of this video, which is why are the English so damn stylish? Because yeah, they got history, but that doesn't explain why so many countries, so many style icons have been influenced by this particular country. Well, the first reason and an uncomfortable one for many people is that the English push their style on others through conquest. You can't help but learn our history and see how we were heavily influenced by the English. The styles of our founding fathers were all taken from England. English influence over in India. You guys were under the English yoke a little bit longer. Many of you guys over there know the stories of how anyone from one of the English colonies, whether it was Australia, South Africa, if you were going to engage with the English, you needed to in many ways dress like the English. But of course, as Gandhi found out on that train in South Africa when he got thrown off, despite looking English, there's a lot more that goes to it. Now, the next reason a lot of English style has infiltrated the world is it freaking works. It's practical. I know it's not typically English, but let's take the Aaron sweater. Yes, 
it's Irish, but you look at the way that sweater was designed, the way it's knitted, the material it's made from, this is a sweater that's made for cold, wet areas. And for those reasons, a lot of English clothing makes sense in other parts of the world where they don't have as long of a history or maybe as developed of a clothing industry. And so they would just take pieces, fabrics like Donegal Tweed. It's going to work over in the Northwest United States because it worked for hundreds of years in a similar climate over in Ireland. And the next reason we see the influence of English style around the world is because England was pretty good about kicking people out of its country and sending them to live in other places. Again, the United States being the example I know best, but I know a lot of you guys are down in Australia, down in South Africa. Maybe you can talk to to this, but here in the United States, if you are of Scottish descent, if you're of Welsh descent, if you're Irish, when these guys came over first generation, they brought over their patterns, they brought over their fabrics. Now, the Scots didn't get us on board with the kilts, but I do know a number of Scottish men that live here that are like third or fourth generations that still wear their kilts around. But my point here is the fabrics. They had a lot of symbolism in these with particular families, with particular patterns, and these traditions were exported to other places. An example that flies under most people's radar, neckties. So, in case you didn't know, after the cravat, the necktie started to become more popular, especially in the last 150 years. And the first neckties over in England, they all had a significant meaning. In fact, you could only wear certain regimental stripes or club ties if you had actually been a member of a certain club or had gone to a certain school or had served in a particular military unit. And by the way, if you ever want to know the difference between an English or an American regimental tie, just simply look at the direction in which the line goes. Nowadays, you're lucky if you can find a guy that actually knows how to tie a tie, but seriously, it is still a skill that I highly recommend. Now, the next reason the English style had an oversized influence on the world is purely economic. Up till the 1930s, England was a hub for clothing manufacturing around the world. When it came to the ability to make specialized fabrics, and thanks to India with imports of incredibly cheap cotton, and clusters of skilled artisans that had for centuries had information passed to them on how to manufacture shoes, clothing, and all the hardware, all the intricacies that went into things like that. In particular, London was the hub if you wanted to understand fashion design, or if you were looking at mercantile fabric trading. When it came to fashion, as in many other industries, England had their fingers all over the place. Now, of course, the Great War from 1914 to 1918 saw a huge shift in production and it all wrapped up during World War II and England's position has never been the same since the post-war. That being said, we did see a change in technology that allowed England to still have an oversized impact on fashion. And the first example of this was the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. In 1953, what was unique about this coronation? It was televised. In fact, it was one of the first major broadcasts that was shown worldwide. And what did people focus in on? What did they want to emulate? The styles. And since then, over the last 50 years, it has been Hollywood that has brought English style to our living rooms and our theaters. I know so many of you guys that are into men's style, we love Cary Grant. And yes, he spends a lot of time over here in many of our movies, but he's actually English. Yeah. Now, gents, if you like this video, you're going to love this one right here. Why are Italian men so stylish? Seriously, why are the Italians so stylish? Guys, check out this video. Again, if you like this one, you are going to love this one. Boom, right here. Oh, yeah.